Star Wars 7x7 episode 1942 today. The final conundrum that we're going to talk about regarding the rise of Skywalker footage we've seen so far with physics professor Patrick Johnson, who is also the author of The Physics of Star Wars. Punch it! Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode and so the final conundrum that we're going to talk about has to do with those horse-like creatures that are running on what appears to be the deck of a Star Destroyer and that Star Destroyer may actually be in motion like flying and so... Yeah, that seems a little bit dangerous. How is this possible? <laughs> and so, with the help of Patrick Johnson, we're going to analyze the situation, but it's also going to digress into a couple of surprising places, including a revisitation of Leia's ejection into space in The Last Jedi, as well as a consideration of Jurassic Park. Yeah, we're actually going to Jurassic Park and about how the brain is a limiter on what your body can do in real life. And yeah, that I think turned out to be one of the most fascinating aspects of this conversation. And so I'm very excited to share that with you. That's coming up right after the break. We're going to jump right in to that final part of the conversation. And so, you know, I'm just going to say the, <laughs> the stuff I would say at the end of the show right now, which is thank you again for joining me for this episode and may the force be with you wherever in the world you may be. But for now, just hang on a second, and right after the break, the final part of my conversation with Patrick Johnson, who is a teaching professor at Georgetown University and the author of The Physics of Star Wars. Hey Rebel Razor, I've made some changes to the Asteroid Belt level at patreon.com slash SW7X7 and they are all with sponsors in mind. So if you want to get the word out about your business, your product, your service to a dedicated Star Wars audience, then please check out patreon.com slash SW7X7 and look for the Asteroid Belt level for details. Again, that's patreon.com slash SW7X7. Um, there was one other thing I was going to ask you about, which is comparatively, I think, less exciting, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but well, we'll see. <laughs> um, so there is one scene where we see horses or what appear to be horse-like creatures running on what appears to be the outside of a Star Destroyer. And this is a scene where, as the camera pans up, we can see a lot of other Star Destroyers in the vicinity. And so it yeah. appears to be taking place in atmosphere, not yeah. in space. And I guess there's a question as to whether the Star Destroyer upon which these horse-like creatures are running is also in the air versus it being, you know, on the ground. And it's just the perspective of mm -hmm. the camera that makes us think that potentially it's in the air. But yeah. how dangerous a thing is it or even <laughs> possible um, yeah. For human beings and, you mm -hmm. know, also potentially other um, species that mm -hmm. we can't necessarily make any suppositions about, yeah. riding horse-like creatures on something like that under the presumption that it's actually in the air and flying. Um, so the <laughs> the dangers of that are uh, lot, uh, many fold. Uh, so uh, <laughs> there are a couple different ways uh, to think about this. So um, if we assume that they... The, are enough like horse uh, horses that they don't like create their own atmosphere around them or something like that. Uh, uh, then uh, they're going to need to be low enough so that they can breathe. Uh, and uh, I don't see any breathing apparatuses on them, but like perhaps uh, there are some kind of hidden ways to breathe uh, in the Star Wars universe that we're going to be introduced to. Um, but uh, it's going to have to be low enough. So we're talking like uh, kind of peak of Mount Everest level of elevation above uh, the ground. So maybe uh, 15 to 30,000 feet, uh, et cetera. Like uh, they seem to be exerting themselves pretty thorough. Like those horses or horse-like creatures are exerting themselves. So um, if they are too far up, those horses are going to run out of oxygen pretty quickly. And if they are enough like horses, horses will run until they actually like will kill themselves like from running uh from exhaustion oh and my so, gosh. Like, okay uh, yeah uh, and so that's a, a one of the things where if you look at i mean 
uh, I was not alive in the uh, old Western days, but like if you watch Western media, they'll always talk about like, oh, resting your horses or switching horses, et cetera. The Pony Express was they'd ride a pony from, well, a, a horse from one location to another, then change horses and then take off again to go as quickly as possible because the horse would need time to rest because that horse would keep running until it died. Uh, and so, oh, wow. uh, okay. Like, yeah. Uh, so if these are truly like horses in that way, then they may keep running even if the Star Destroyer starts taking off. And uh, that could be spelled a lot of danger for them. Uh, that would also spell a lot of danger for the humans uh, who are uh, like exerting themselves physically, probably not as much as the horses, but still um, exerting themselves quite a bit. Um, the things that I think are interesting uh, and dangerous about this are uh, like I have never really thought of uh, cavalry in the Star Wars universe in like the traditional sense. Uh, and so like um, what is the military advantage of having horses running across the Star Destroyer? Like ah. what are they trying to accomplish? Um, I am not a military strategist, so I don't really know what uh, they would be doing. But like if they are on an enemy Star Destroyer, all they the enemies would have to do is take off and just like float up. And that would be super easy for them to do. <laughs> and like even just float up a little bit and then turn upside down. <laughs> and that would be uh, problematic for anybody trying to ride a horse on there. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so like uh, trying to figure out uh, what's going on in that scene, like certainly if there are other star destroyers around, you don't expect to have the rebel Alliance just have a fleet of star destroyers at their disposal where they'd all be good star destroyers per se. Like, uh, uh, like that is a scene that, I am very intrigued by because there are so many questions that I look at and I say like even my best theories that I think could explain what's going on still seemed seem like well really like what's going on <laughs> like there has to be more to it than that and like certainly uh freezing uh the frames it looks like these are uh hairier than like what we think of as horses they might have tusks it, it's hard to tell but like um, so maybe they are able to survive in colder temperatures as they go up, but like, uh, certainly there is a limit to how high they can go before it becomes a severe danger. And certainly once they get to the end of the star destroyer, they're going to have to turn around and go somewhere else. And so, uh, <laughs> or maybe they're like planning to ride along there and then like transfer to another star destroyer or like get off of there to like move to something else. And so, uh, where are they going, uh, with their charge? Like it looks pretty, uh, like, uh, traditional like historical warfare of like they send in the cal uh, cavalry charge kind of thing. So I, I really want to know what's going on. Just like I want to know what's going on with several of these other things we've talked about. Um, I, but like the, the physics of it uh, like is uh, uh, less e interesting to me than the military strategy. Uh, but like uh, another thought that uh, I, I've thought about is like, we saw in The Last Jedi uh, Leia be ejected into space and certainly it showed the effects of being in space and like starting to freeze. Um, but please don't try this at home if you're watching. Uh, if you were to do this yourself, you would be frozen very, very quickly. I'm sure you could say maybe there's some movie magic of slow motion as to why it was taking so long. But um, certainly like once you are in the vacuum of space uh, without the counter pressure of atmosphere, um, water will boil. And, uh, like, so you've probably heard that your body is 60, 70% of, uh, water, mm -hmm. 60 to 70% of you will boil away very quickly. Uh, and boiling is a cooling process, which is a little bit weird to think about since we think of boiling water as being super hot. Yeah. But what's actually happening is when you boil water, you are adding heat to the bottom. And then when it gets to the point of boiling, the process of boiling is all the hot water molecules going away. So you are adding heat, but then it is taking away heat by boiling, thus keeping it at the exact same temperature. So like, even though you are still adding heat, the temperature doesn't change because the boiling is cooling it down as fast as you are heating it up. Um, and so, uh, like as the water boils away from you, it will cool your body down to, uh, ice temperatures and then you'll freeze. And that's what will lead to your death. But, uh, if you uh, still have some counter pressure around you, it will slow that process down. And if you can slow it down enough, the heat losses from radiation will take minutes for you to die, which still, please don't try this at home. But like, <laughs> uh, but, uh, like uh, it will give Leia plenty of time to get herself back. And so um, maybe 
uh, there was enough atmosphere from the blowout that like there was enough of an atmosphere surrounding her that like was able to keep her alive long enough to uh, kind of force pull herself back in. Um, I, my personal pet theory is that she used the force to pull the atmosphere around her um, to like kind of create a bubble of air so that she could breathe and it would create the counter pressure to keep her uh, alive long enough to be able to marry Poppins her way back into the ship. And so um, maybe they have found a way to like use a channel, the force to create a bubble of atmosphere around them to protect them um, on the star destroyer as it takes off. Or uh, maybe uh, something else is going on uh, with the force to like create a atmosphere of safety for them. That is a really fascinating uh, place that you've taken it back to that there might be something force related involved with those horse like creatures in the, characters writing them i yeah would not have i was not seeing that one coming so uh, uh my brain goes to crazy places sometimes and uh like uh certainly my friends and my uh, family sometimes are like cool it cool it <laughs> we saw a second or two of horses or horse-like creatures running across a piece of metal with cannons you only saw the star destroyers in the background like now you're introducing bubbles of force, uh, uh, bubbles of atmosphere created by the force. Like you're going a little crazy there, but I don't know. This is what I like to do. <laughs> I, I don't think that's, I mean, it's certainly a pretty outrageous idea, but certainly the way you describe it with Leia, I don't think it's all that outrageous. And it also seems like it would fall under the notion of how people in very extreme circumstances have been demonstrated to be able to do very extreme yeah. things and yeah. unexpectedly so too. Yeah. So you might imagine that maybe the notion of controlling the atmosphere around oneself is an outlandish thought, but that somebody with force powers might be able to do something that extreme in an extreme circumstance. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And like, I, I love that as a thought because, um, just this reminds me of another fun physics kind of fact that uh, it's a little bit uh, morbid, I guess. But like if somebody becomes electrocuted, uh, like it will send an electrical pulse through whatever piece of their body is touching it. And so like um, I, I know this is a Star Wars podcast, but I think you and your fans will uh, forgive me for bringing up Jurassic Park. But like when Timmy's <laughs> on the fence and mm -hmm. the fence turns on. Um, again, please do not try this at home. This is like the, the space thing I was saying kind of as a joke, because we're not there to be able to try that at home. But like right. here, please, please do not try this at home. But like when Timmy is launched off the fence, that is actually pretty physically accurate because the electricity going through his arms will cause all of his muscles to contract, um, stronger than he would be able to command his body to do so. Like your brain has a regulator that prevents you from doing these things because it is possible for you to contract your limbs or expand your limbs. Uh, so fast that like you'll tear your muscle off your bone and things and like we have strength beyond what our brain allows us to do and so in these extreme circumstances one of the theories is that like that regulator gets turned off and we're able to do these feats of strength etc and the idea that a force sensitive person like that uh the force uh would be able to manifest in these more extreme ways in these extreme circumstances i really like um i also will say that we never saw the full extent of leia's powers like uh she could be stronger than anybody we've seen before uh and that she's been kind of just like hiding uh, not obscurity but like force obscurity all along of like she's just sitting on the side like brother, I could do way better than that, uh, <laughs> like the whole time. Uh, and maybe that's what her smile at the end of uh, The Last Jedi is about, of just kind of like, that was very impressive, but I could do better. <laughs> yeah. So who knows? Well, this has been fantastic. I'm so grateful that you said yes to coming on the show again, and your perspectives on this are just utterly fascinating and exciting. And I'm um, I'm so glad that we got to do this again. Um, yeah. Patrick, thank you so much. Um, if anybody wants to uh, learn more about the stuff that you've done with Star Wars, obviously they can check out The Physics of Star Wars, which is your really awesome book. And um, is there anywhere else that people should connect with you? Or should they just grab the book and um, so, check uh, out your interview? <laughs> I, I think grab your book.
I grab, I grab my book, uh, check out my interview, check out the other times I've been on your show. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have the episode numbers memorized to be able to say. But, How uh, dare you? That's yeah. okay. I'll, I'll handle uh, that. <laughs> but I found it very interesting that uh, uh, like when I uh, got onto Skype to prepare for this, it said uh, the last call that we had initiated was a year ago and a day. Uh, so uh, oh, really? October 23rd was the last time we talked. Uh, I hope I'm not pulling back the curtain if it uh, there's a delay between recording and uh uh, releasing, but uh, yeah, uh, so I found that really interesting. I was like, oh, we talked a, a, almost exactly a year ago. That's um, wild. Yeah, but uh, to f find out what I'm up to, like certainly uh, pick up the book wherever books are sold or your local bookstore or your major retailers. Uh, it should be available at all of the above. Um, but uh, like if you're interested in communicating with me, uh, I do have a Twitter account that my publisher tells me I should use more uh, that uh, I, I'm not very active on. So it's probably not that interesting to check out. But uh, like if you have like thoughts about the things that I've come up with, like you can find my information uh, like going uh, through the Georgetown physics page uh, kind of thing. Uh, you can find me there uh, and I get emails from people uh, at, like every good professor. I am sometimes terrible at responding to things uh, in a timely fashion. Um, my students feel very sad about that at times. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like, I do try to get back to everybody who contacts me uh, with like, either I think you're very wrong because of this, or uh, I think you're very right because of that. Um, I, I like to uh, get back to people when I can. But like, please, if I don't get back to you in a week or two, don't feel bad. It's not that I'm ignoring you. It's just sometimes things stack up. And I, I have to do my job before I do all my pleasure things. So like uh, sometimes responding to people's fun theories that they send to me uh, is a thing that I have to do in my free time outside of my job. And uh, so uh, like, I love what I do, but like there are sometimes times when I get an email, I'm like, I'm really excited about this, but I got a test coming up and I got to write that exam. So yeah, yeah I, I, I get it. And I'm yeah. sure our listeners will get it too. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but again, Patrick, thank you so much yeah. for the time. Thank you for your expertise. And um, yeah, I guess maybe October of next year, we'll yeah. be talking again, <laughs> if not sooner. Yeah. Well, let me know. I'm always happy to come back. And especially after the film comes out, maybe we could recap and say like, well, here's all the ways you got everything wrong because you just didn't <laughs> know about it. So we'll see. All right. I, I like that idea and I'm going to yep. take you up on it. Okay. You know how to get a hold of me. I do. <laughs> take care. Good day. Bye. This podcast is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox. It is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other related Star Wars items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited or their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2019 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.